Our investigation into this Goss's wilt uh, started in 2009. Previously, it had been a mild, weak disease in six counties in eastern Colorado, western Nebraska. Then all of a sudden, in 2009, it jumped clear to Pennsylvania and north to Manitoba. Until right now, it uh, affects about 80% of the U.S. corn crop. Canny and frontal field that we stopped at three weeks ago, and what we're looking at were disease stalks and shanks that were rotten. Now at that time, it was early phase of the disease, and we know how it works, is the bacteria and the semi-metallic crystal end up plugging the plumbing tissue of the plant. This is what we're seeing in about 90% of the acres in Iowa and much of the Midwest. These are fields that all should be dark green, yet on September 16th, instead, everything is brown. This is a new bacterial disease that's killed the corn early the last eight years, trimming yields, raising the threat of having contaminated grain being harvested from the fields. The National Ag Statistics Bureau came out with their estimate last week and they said 26% of the corn in Iowa had reached maturity, 90% or better was dead. So we have to make the assumption that roughly 70% died before it reached maturity. That is not normal. Yeah, it's amazing. This corn was bright green, Labor Day weekend on Sunday. I was here, I came back two, two days later and it was all brown. And that's when I realized that uh, the Bioimprove was really doing something on mine. What do you see for your size? Disappointing. There's an untreated ear. You lose the green tissue, you lose the ability to fill the kernels. And also These are going to be a lot healthy. smaller than this stuff. Let's see if we were looking at black layer on the other one. I'll bet this one's, oh, look at this. Kernel depth's really shallow. About three eighths of an inch, so you're almost a quarter inch shorter. Died before it's time. Look at that. Ooh. See, the clavibacter rots all the tissue, dissolves the woody tissue. Cobs are mushy, you won't be able to get them off decently. And separating the grain from the cob is really tough. Grain quality, that's the stuff you don't want to put in your bin. It's the new gosses. Reason why is the actual gosses is caused by a clavibacter bacteria involving a semi-metallic crystal and uh, it stays in the soil. It's probably being transmitted either by the seed or through the air because we're picking it up in combined cab filters and vacuum, grain vac filters. We have a number of uh, new diseases and also many re-emerging diseases that on the Threat Pathogens Committee uh, for the United States, I've served on for about 40 years. We look at these re-emerging diseases as diseases that used to be controlled very effectively, or that we knew were there kind of sitting in the sidelines, but they were never of economic importance for us to get excited about. Those diseases now are becoming very serious and threaten the sustainability of our agricultural production. One of them that I'd like to discuss is Goss's wilt on corn. Goss's wilt as an economic problem for us is an induced disease brought to most parts of North America and the rest of the world through genetic engineering. Now I mention that because there are three things that you have to have for a severe disease. You have to have a pathogen, in this case, the bacterial pathogen is Clavibacter 
Michigan ants, Nebraskensis. You have to have susceptible corn hybrids, and that's what's been brought to us by genetic engineering, because in order to have expression of the genetically engineered traits, they had to go back to some of the more susceptible corn hybrids. You also had to have an induced or a favorable environment for expression of, of the pathogen in those susceptible corn hybrids. And that's because when you apply glyphosate or with the genetic uh, disruption of the genetic code, we see an increased susceptibility to many diseases that are requiring fungicide application. When we apply that fungicide that you nullify six of the seven genetic characteristics for resistance to Goss's wilt. So we provide a more susceptible plant. We change the environment favorable for the pathogen. And we have a more uh, pathogenic and increased virulence in our bacterial pathogen. Goss's wilt was formerly considered a very wimpy disease. Uh, we now see it with that induced intransigence so that it costs us uh, one plus billion bushels of corn annually in the Midwest anytime we have a favorable environment for this disease to express it. Goss's wilt is indigenous to, the, to North America. It's a disease that originated here. It's now been spread throughout the world on primarily through seed stalks. Uh, it can be seed borne, water borne, and wind borne. It can also be bug borne. We also see a reduced nutrient density in our crops so that it's a loss that we don't attribute a great deal to, but it has a tremendous impact when it comes to feeding our animals or to feeding our human population. And this is a vascular disease, developed systemically, that critical period where you have a higher uh, nutrient need is one that is especially reduced as a result of the vascular plugging from this pathogen. On the leaves, you'll see the lesions then will follow the vascular architecture of the host, of the plant. And so you get long streaks of, of uh, water-soaked lesions that will develop. They'll start from just a small spot, and then it spreads from those through the vascular system uh, of the plant. You'll also see uh, uh, what we call a salting out of the bacteria. This the bacteria is able to multiply and grow to the extent that it actually just seeps out of the tissue and appears as a salt-like deposition on those uh, the outside of the tissue, and we call that a salting out effect, a typical characteristic of the Clavobacter nebraskensis pathogen, in this case, the bacterial pathogen causing this disease. This then causes the plants to die or to uh, prematurely age. These are symptoms, essentially, of just starvation. They're denied the water and the uh, nutrients required to keep those tissues alive, and, and so, you see the uh, effects then overall on the plant. So it dies before maturity. That latter 30 days of maturity is very critical for nutrient density. That's when your protein, when uh, your grain fill is uh, maximized, and that's the period that's cut short with this particular disease. So that if you just look at the surfactants and the fungicides or in uh, the Roundup and other herbicides that, that are used, those surfactants are there for a purpose. And that purpose is to increase penetration of, of the 
pathogen that the surfactant alone will eliminate or nullify six of the seven genetic sources of resistance to Gauss's wilt. When the glyphosate is applied, it nullifies the seventh source because it shuts down those physiological defenses that the plant has. Even though we have genetic uh, pathways that have been inserted to restore part of the shikimate pathway, they're not fully effective in restoring the resistance to Gauss's wilt. A normal, non-infected corn plant, you'll see the ears dry down and, and then droop and drop because of the weight of that kernel as it's fully developing and storing all of those nutrients for us. What we, we see with Gauss's wilt is that you'll see the top part of the plant, that highly efficient photosynthetic uh, part of the plant, uh, at the late stage of, of development and grain fill stage that actually dries off and dies because the vascular system has been plugged and it's no longer getting the moisture and the nutrients that it requires. Other uh, corn hybrids and other situations may die from the bottom up. And again, this depends on the environment and stage of infection, uh, stage of disease development. So uh, we see the two conditions, usually we, with Gauss's wilt, uh, then the whole plant will uh, finally die off uh, two to six weeks before uh, genetic maturity is established. So that when we focus on uh, the pathogen with Gauss's wilt, we need to focus on those things that will reduce its virulence. That becomes a nutritional factor. The biological control has one of the greatest potentials for controlling Gauss's wilt. Uh, so that biological control with an organism uh, uh, that can compete and can suppress the activity of the clavobacter becomes a very viable option for us. And one of those that uh, we're seeing with some very excellent success has been the bioimprove type of an approach. Well, my name is Salam Awada and I'm the president of uh, AxiTech Inc. So what is bioimprove? Bioimprove contains a spectrum of ingredients. Uh, the main components are biological extracts or biochemicals. There is also uh, some, micro some nutrients, as well as buffers, stabilizers, penetrants, natural growth stimulants, and natural surfactants. Some of the components in the biological extracts in BioImprove activate the natural defense or immune system of the plants to help protect it against infection by pathogens such as bacteria and fungi. These components act as elicitors by activating the natural defense system of the plant. There is also stabilizers because we know as we apply uh, BioImprove, we sometimes mix it with other products. So it's critical to have stabilizers to prevent the components from reacting uh, in the mixing tank with other ingredients. Uh, also to help uh, from uh, interaction with components in the soil or within the plant itself. BioImprove is not a bactericide or fungicide. BioImprove boosts the natural defense system of the plants and they prepare the plants to better fight stress and pathogens. We are excited about uh, BioImprove. It's a new a product in our line of products uh, is exciting because it's targeting a new uh, uh, technology um, which is the defense system of the plants. Uh, we're excited about what we're seeing also in the Midwest. I've seen a video and I've seen 
pictures of uh, on actual fields that have been holding green uh, until October. So that's always makes us proud and happy with what we put together and what we work on. Because uh, Excitec uh, is dedicated to research and we're happy to see good things happening that helps the farmer. I'm standing in another healthy field in Northern Story County. Again, the plants are green and healthy, even in spite of having the same weather, the same temperature, same amount of rain as other fields. Yields here versus other fields, he's probably going to be 40 to 60 bushel an acre better. Proof is in the pudding. I had this here in my hand earlier. I just walked in, grabbed another average ear. Diameter on these ears is phenomenal. Last year, this field was running 265 to 28500 uh, bushels an acre. To draw a comparison, this field, we're tickle paint with a yield. Standability is good. Plant health is good. Right next door is a field that was hit very hard by the disease. I'll stand in front of it. You can see it's completely brown and extremely dead. A person might be wondering why are we so concerned about having a healthy plant with green ears. The answer is what the leaves are doing on the plant is converting sunlight energy, carbon dioxide from the air and water from the soil into sugars and the sugars make up most of what fills the grain. This would be coming from the green field. Now from the brown field where the leaves were brown, it died early, we've got ears that are looking just like this. This was picked from one of these fields. Guess which field? I've had a lot of uh, disease in uh, my other fields for years around here. We're in a lower hanging area that gets a lot of uh, late season disease. Usually around uh, Labor Day weekend, uh, the plants all pretty well turn uh, brown and, and die prematurely. Uh, so that's why I was very intrigued with the uh, BioImproved product that Bob had uh, told me that he want, wanted me to try. So uh, we put it on uh, right at Tassel. I've been really uh, amazed compared to the uh, fields around uh, my neighborhood and here we are today and uh, this is 113 day corn that was planted on the 6th of May. Uh, We've got, it's not black layered yet, and uh, we've got green plants all the way top to bottom. Uh, as you can see, we're filled out and still uh, still adding, adding to the yield at this point in time, which is very unique for the whole Midwest region. I travel 14 states. In the last three weeks, I haven't seen anything but brown corn everywhere I've went. So Farmers have to be aware of it. Uh, they need to educate themselves on it. Uh, proper nutrition and having a high enough micronutrient and nutritional level in the plant to uh, help the plant mount and immune system response is what they have to do. And then the BioImprove uh, is probably one of the major tools in the toolbox on it. But that's a compare the ears. Is that so you one? got a choice? This one come from an adjoining field. This one or this one. Yeah, these are all bioimproved. Shallow ears. dent. Shiny. Seeing is believing. Certainly making a believer out of me. The corn on corn with the bioimprove on was yielding 275 to 295 bushel an acre. The best he's ever had before was 225. Looking at the ear here, it is filled right to the tip, kernels up and over. Go to the one right to its right, same thing. Okay, well we're going to measure um, ground corn samples and we're looking at the difference between the use of BioImprove and then corn that has not been treated with BioImprove for changes to um, Goss's wilt. And so what I'm doing right now, I'm going to use this, which is the Bruker um, SD3 XRF. 
And what that means is X-ray fluorescent technology. So we're going to use X-rays and we're going to energize the atoms in this sample that I'm going to put on there. And this is ground, ground corn kernels. This is our bioimprove at the D level. And then we're just going to press it down because we want to take the air out because this instrument is so sensitive that we'll actually measure the photons of argon in the sample if we don't just sort of try and make it a little tighter and, um, and give it a little bit more density. So we just press it down with a spoon. All we've done is ground dry corn in a coffee grinder. And now we're going to measure it, and it's this simple. Um, this instrument is calibrated for food grains for both the micronutrients and the macronutrients. This is our rhodium peak here. Now, the tube itself is made out of rhodium. The reason rhodium was chosen is because most plants don't ever take up rhodium. In fact, rhodium is a very hard element to actually get access to. So it seemed a good idea to make sure we're using rhodium instead of some other element that we might actually want to look at and would be overlapping. Now, again, this is our rhodium peak, so if we want, we want to make sure our matrix is the same, we need to have an overlap on the rhodium peak. But let's look at what our, so this is our potassium, this is our calcium here, sulfur, we've got phosphorus next, and we've got um, silica down here and aluminum. So now let's go to concentration. We see silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, potassium, and calcium. And this, I remind you, is the bioimprove middle of the cob kernels. We're going to move A to B, and our spectrum is going to change color. And now the non-treated D kernels, and I'm going to press it down again. Okay, and we're going to run this next sample. And now you'll see a red line start coming up. This is our non-treated sample, and we're comparing it to our bioimproved sample at the D level or the middle of the cob. So we can see our matrix is fine. We can compare. Now this is interesting because you can see that our non-treated um, cob from the Goss's well is actually lower in almost everything. So it's lower potassium, lower calcium, lower sulfur, lower phosphorus, but actually it looks like it's about the same silicon. So why don't we look now? This is where we're doing our macro elements. So let's just compare. Well, our silicon is actually quite similar. And we look at the phosphorus and, oh my gosh, look at this. 1300 to 303, 1200 sulfur to 700, 3900 potassium to 2200 potassium, and then the calcium well, calcium is not nearly as affected as all the other elements. This whole cob, if we look at the numbers here and we compare them, this whole cob of corn is nutrient poor. It's a poor food source. It's poor for animals, it's poor for people. This is much better, and these are the kinds of numbers that we want to see when we're looking at food density. So, better numbers, poorer numbers, the effects of disease on translocation, and translocation into the seed head. Now, here's the other thing with that. When a seed is germinating, it needs these nutrients. That's why those nutrients are in the seed, because the seed actually needs them in order to grow a plant. If we were growing this for seed, we now have a problem. These seedlings will lack vigor, because they don't have enough nutrient to actually grow a vigorous plant. The other thing about this is, is that our non-treated plants actually die um, and stop filling anywhere up to four weeks before our treated plants. Any plant that is severely stressed by disease knows that stress and goes immediately into reproductive mode and tries to get as many viable seeds as it can. But it's forcing the issue. So that's another reason why we see this decline in nutrients. Because it doesn't have, and, and because it's translocation system, the way it moves the nutrients up into the plant from the roots, it's all blocked up. Because that fungus, that bacteria, is actually in there. And the thing is, when we get these lesions, not only do we get the one disease, but we'll get other diseases, and the whole system will become blocked. 
And so it's, it's like we have this block in the tube. So if you think about it like a hose, it's like you've kinked the hose and nothing's going up. Now we'll find some other ways up and some other ways down, but they won't be nearly as good. And when we're forcing the issue, because we're all stressed, we need to reproduce as a plant, it means that we just take what we've got and we put it in there and hope for the best. What myself and other members of our group have discovered through eight years of working with this new Goss's wilt disease is that we have to use a multi-step program. There's no silver bullet. We first of all have to improve the health of the soil through uh, better cultural techniques, use of cover crops, build the soil biology and understand it. Next, we need to build the nutritional level of the plant as high as possible. And lastly, the product we're looking for was something that would knock out the Goss's wilt on a long-term basis through the season. We found it. It was the BioImprove. And what we are seeing with it is 30, 40, 60, 100 bushel an acre yield increase, which has been dramatic and provides a very strong ROI to corn farmers.